Oh, Alan, we are going again. Hey, everybody, we got to get going. I hope you love that music. That music always gets me so jacked up. You know what? Because you you have highs and lows in business, you know, Alan. And um, here we are recording this one in January, and it should be a low time for me, and it is. Uh, we're a little slower. First time ever in my business. For like one more COVID. week, right? Yeah, but but I'm in the doldrums. I'm down. I mean, it's over. I mean, actually, I I, I, uh, I, I, I You're like a there. kid with candy. You know, I was I, mean, I had the sugar high yeah, for the... two years after COVID. I was riding high. I mean, you said, "Hey, work," and I said, "How high?" And I was like, "Hey, it's going to cost this much," and they believe we'll give you more money. I was like, "Oh my God, I'm printing money." I didn't even buy a boat. Oh, actually, I did buy a boat. Uh, so buy anyway, boat. I did. So, but it was great, and that's the high season. But you know what? You don't build your business like that. You've got to build your business for long term sustainability. You got to build it for that. And so that's the one thing while I say I'm on the low, you know, I'm not, but it's you know not that... just all champagne and caviar and bikinis in Vegas. Chris, is that what you're saying? Well, Have you been humbled this week. Well, I'm humbled this week, but however, after we're done with this podcast, Chrissy is going to be on an airplane heading to the big Vegas going home because it's football weekend and daddy's got to go out there and make some money back. So I'm going to take, I'm going to take January Vegas owes you January's revenue and I'm going to play it. I'm going to play it all on red. Here we go. No, I tell you what, that's not what we'll hit it. It'll be, it'd be awesome. It would be awesome. Wouldn't it be great? All you know, your problems would be solved. You know, every time I go out there and Vegas gets more and more buildings, I'm like, you know what? It's because people like me come out here and we win, win, win <laughs> all the time. Oh, we don't, do we? Oh, my gosh. All right, Alan. We can't do this. We can't keep talking just because it's just you and me. We have a very special guest who's here in studio with us. This is somebody that I have known about for probably 10 years. I have never got a chance to meet him. And then when I told Alan who I had coming on the podcast, he went, what? Surprise guest? I know him. We've actually talked together. We actually cried together. We love each other. He goes, okay, it wasn't that bad. But it, but he no, goes, it actually was. He's like one of my favorite, most influential people I never see. And the first time I met him, it was through networking. Somebody goes, you got, you got to meet Steve Miller. And I swear it was 10 or 15 minutes in and we both had tears streaming down our faces. Really and I, I mean, I'm a... I'm an emotional guy, but uh, I don't cry very often. <laughs> and, right. and there we were, two dudes in a coffee shop just letting it rip. It was good. So everybody, welcome. Steve Miller, Fly Like an Eagle, not Steve Miller Band, but Steve Miller, I can help you in a business transition. That's at least how I know him. But we're going to get a little more background. Welcome, Steve. Well, thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it. And very nice to meet you. But yes, Alan and I, I don't cry much either, but we were... <laughs> We were crying. I don't know what happened there. I don't the know. Connection? It was it was a great conversation, though. Yeah. So, Steve, uh, uh, as we know you today, you are a franchise consultant, mm -hmm. and not really a franchise consultant or a broker in this true sense of the word, where all you're trying to do is catch that almighty commission mm -hmm. and place somebody in something that's not going to work. You have an integrity behind you. That's what we know about you. Um, but before we get into the business that you do, we want to know kind of where you're from and how did you get into this stuff? What Did you go to school? Did you go to college? Did you? Is this something you've always wanted to do? Tell us a little bit more about your background. Yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, first off, married 39 years. We have two sons, uh, 32 and 31. Came home last night after a five-year stint with the Air Force. They were at Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany. They came home last night. God willing, they're going to start a family. Oh and man, that's huge news! So he's Congratulations. He, he just left, and then my um, older son moved back from Colorado. He had a franchise out there. I'll tell you about that later. They moved back about four years ago, and we have a granddaughter with them, and another one on the way. Beautiful. So it is beautiful. We are and, so blessed. And by the way, Steve brought a really nice beer. You know what? We didn't bring that up because cheers, Alan. Cheers. We don't do cheers as much, but and, we uh, got a very high IPA. I do because that's all we do is drink while we talk. But you know what? I stay, we stay between the lines. Okay. Every once in a while, I did have one guy tell me, dude, how often do you podcast? Cause I think your liver can't take it. I'm like, dude, I only do it like every other week. That's why you take pills for gout. Uh, that's funny. You should say that. Uh, so quick gout light update. I'm okay. back down to normal. Oh. Um, and so now it's just a bunion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's hell I'm being really old. getting to know you is one. I'm about ready to weep because of all this story. <laughs> oh my god! You know, last episode, if you didn't listen, Tom Reber was on, and man, he was awesome. Go back, find it, go listen to that one. But Alan will tell you that one of the best things he ever did was get a colonoscopy. And what he didn't, what you didn't hear on that episode, is him chastising me and Tom 
for not having colonoscopies yet. So we've got to get that done. There's your PSA. Get a colonoscopy. Can we go back to Steve, please? It just really isn't as big a deal as you make it out. To I know. Me. I just want to say it, that. I know. He's right. Yeah. All right. It isn't. All right. It isn't. So Steve, yeah. uh, what, yeah, what are, I, are you saying you're going to get one? This is, uh, yes, I'm going to do a colonoscopy. Are you going to do it soon? I'm going to do it with the Dr. Sanchez with slender fingers. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly what she said. was. He was Shan- Sanchez, dirty, <laughs> slender fingers. I'm in. Yeah, doing it. Cool. She, she started explaining to me what she was going to do. And I'm like, I really don't want to know. And she goes, well, at least just know I have slender fingers. You that know what? what the doctor actually, said. You know what? I'm actually do that when I'm in Vegas. Okay. <laughs> going to keep moving on. Steve doesn't want to hear this because I asked Steve, hey, how did we get here? What'd you do? And he led with his kids. That shows you a little bit about this integrity of this dude. Number one. That is awesome that your son was in the Air Force. Uh, I'm sure you're very proud of him. Yeah, thanks like for any his father. service. Yeah, he's yeah, awesome. yeah. That is so great. But that is awesome. So, and they're moving back here, so you get to see the grandbabies, which is the true joy in life, as opposed yeah. to raising them. No I doubt mean, about it. it right? Is, you, can, you can. We send can send them home. home. We can only hope. I could. Can I could. Send them home. Yeah. So yeah, the the infamous daughter is in school again, uh, to be a physician assistant, and so we just had a chat where I actually had to tell her her budget because we're going to help her out a little bit while she did that because she saved um, a grand total over two and a half years to go to PA school of... Is it less than a 1000 Yes, it is. Thank you very much. Lord. So we had to put her on a budget. I said, since we, you and I can't have a conversation about it, I'm going to email you with what I'm going to do. And that's it. And she went, good with me. I said, the best conversation we ever had right here was over email. There you go. Now we know how to communicate. Yeah. All right, back to Steve. Steve, what... What'd you do? Uh, you graduated uh, high school. You're in Ohio. That's went, where you're from. Went to Bowling Green State University uh, uh, in Northwest Ohio. Graduated with a degree in restaurant management. And the <laughs> reason Whoa. was because I, I was awful at math. And I went to a rural high school that prepared us for roasting soybeans and plowing fields and not math. And I got to college. It's like I was, I was a lost ball in tall weeds when it came to math. Did you grow up in muck country? Isn't that yes. what they call it? It's well, yeah, yeah, it is. Hey, I don't want that gold nugget to go away. Put this one, just file this one away. I was a lost ball in tall weeds. I was. <laughs> that means so much to I me. I could not get through math ninety. <laughs> I had like two, three hundred level courses. So I said, "What curriculum could I take that would get me through college? If I could have paid for that diploma, I would have paid for it." And so I found restaurant management, and I was with a bunch of nursing students and people who were going to medical. So I took that route, didn't have to do any more math, graduated, had an internship with uh, Steak and Ale back in the day. It was owned by Pillsbury. Oh my gosh, Steak and Ale. Is that, that's not even still around anymore. I think there's a couple. There may be a couple. It was owned by Pillsbury at the time, moved to Chicago, was an assistant manager in Chicago. They moved me to Detroit, Madison Heights. and Other country. Go uh, Lions. And it was, in, and they had a deal, the, the manager had a deal with the Lions to bring them their meals during the coach's dinner on Thursday night. They did a trade for tickets with that restaurant. So, anyway, long story, I was there for about two weeks, got to experience Detroit, got to experience restaurant management for about a year and a half. I said, this is not for me. Mm. I calculated with what I was, the hours I was working, with what I was being paid, which is a salary of $13,500 a year. <laughs> I was Check the lowest people. paid. 13, five. I was the lowest they paid employee in the restaurant for the number of hours I was working. So I went back to Ohio. My parent, my dad had a dry cleaning business and he wanted me to come back into the business. I was there for two weeks and it was creating so much strife within the family that I said, it's not worth a relationship with my, my brother and my dad for me to stay here, move to Washington, DC and got into a position in sales, which led to meeting Betsy my wife, and it then led to a, a position with a company called, at the time, it was called Baxter Travenol. Uh, probably now, I don't know how many, multi-billion dollar medical product company. Baxter Pill, ba- Baxter Pharmaceutical? That's part of it. Yeah, they do medical products, medical distribution. It's a massive company. I was with them in D.C. Uh, so when you, uh, you know, I think one of the things that I want to, uh, as we go through this, yeah. You know, you don't know what you're going to do. And that's why I love having these conversations about, hey, where'd you come from? And Alan gets behind me. And like, hey, we take too much time. But, you know, you don't know what you want to do a lot of times when you're 18, 19, 20. I'm the mean one, apparently. You know, Alan is, he actually is mean people. You know, you don't know this. I seem so nice. me after the podcast. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, it, you know, it's actually abuse. But, no, you you uh, you transitioned quickly. You went restaurant, 
dry clean, not working. How'd you get to DC? Opportunity, buddy, a happenstance? This was in 19... I got to DC the day Ronald Reagan was inaugurated, 1981, January of 81. Great patriot. And yes. And so the government was not in the middle of a recession like Northeast Ohio or Pittsburgh or, Pittsburgh or Detroit. The or all government is never in a recession. Bingo. Oh. I saw that. Yeah. And I had a roommate who'd moved to DC. He was with Arthur Anderson. So I decided... And I wanted to move south because I'm not built for cold weather and I hate it. So I moved down there, uh, got a position selling calculators and copying machines. How ironic is that? that? That's why you're laughing. I love that. So couldn't do two plus two, but I'm selling you a calculator. You need a TI-92. Well, actually, at that time, probably a TI-24. The calculator I was selling? Was a print display cal- print display calculator that was four hundred ninety eight dollars. I know those things were so expensive. No, no and my competition was two hundred and fifty. Oh, okay. Oh, so you were selling the premium. I had to learn to yeah. sell on value, not price, because oh. it's the race to the bottom if you're selling on price. And I sold. Oh, the, there's a gold nugget. I sold the stew out of those things. Did you and really? I did, and uh, got promoted to a manager. I was twenty. 3 24 i was had sales team reporting to me one showed up at the russian embassy to sell them some equipment and we had the fbi <laughs> on our yeah i was on our front it was at, literally at our office the next day inquiring why was why were you at the russian yeah embassy? don't don't sell the russians the, no. the good calculator oh this is one calculators used to be repaired we would send technicians out to repair calculators oh so CIA guys, uh, this is eighty. This is eighty four. Right? Calculator 81, repair. 82, 83, right in there. Okay, yeah, right. And then yeah. it's amazing how fast. And so, just uh, checkpoint. A lot of people listen to this thing. Uh, for those of us who remember those days, if you're a little bit younger than Alan, uh, because you know I am <laughs> um, a little younger than Alan. No, okay, I remember I'm, these like, days. I'm older but than him. It's not though, the but... age; it's a mileage, Chris. <laughs> right, right. We are seasoned, as we know, but. You know that's just the that's just the how quickly technology arcs. So oh, eighty one yeah. eighty two a four hundred eighty five dollar print calculator, which probably, if you're envisioning it right now, is probably about what five six inches wide and about ten inches, maybe about the size of your my current laptop your monitor. Yeah. yeah, so eleven by fourteen. So it's mm-hmm. a it's a big calculator, mm-hmm. but you're sending people out to to do that. And at the time, everybody was like, oh wow. I put this thing in and this thing in, and it comes back with the right number. Yeah. Right. Because I remember uh, being trained as a kid. We had to learn our math tables. You guys all remember that. And I had, of course, Sister Mary Margaret saying, you have to, yeah, fingernails still hurting. And those are not my knuckles. And so they would say, you know what? It's not going to happen for you. You've got to learn to do those calculations yourself. And now look at us today. Right. Right. I can't do, I honestly can't do nine plus eight without hitting my calculator. I mean, my, my first Pavlovian response is to go right to my calculator. Even though I know the number I've been trained, I just, I stop. So you're back, you're selling this stuff, but you're selling on value, not price. Right. And not to the Russians. Thank you. So I, I I was noticed he didn't answer that. He did sell to the Russians. <laughs> Honestly, uh, Alan he did sell to the Russians. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Oh, thank you. All right, can we can we just say it, Listen, man? You know what? When I first started my business, yeah, Alan, you've heard me say this before. Yeah. I would sell anything to anybody at any time. I would do anything to anybody and, at any time. And if I could sell to the Russians, I would have. Too. And think about what happened though. Like twelve years later, the whole the whole thing fell. All of communism fell because we sold calculators to the Russians. <laughs> so That's the, the moral. truth is finally That's coming the out. The story. The CIA was in. Uh-huh. Oh, I love it. Okay, it's so operated. there you go. Hi, everybody. This could be a true crime podcast. You might want to see us. We're in a great genre. Um, if you want to hear a spy novel story, you, you just got to look up Steve Miller, Calculators, 1981, yeah. 83. All right. So you're selling, you're learning that stuff. And you're feeling your oats. Come on, you're selling. You you became a manager early yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. Let's keep rocking. I was recruited for a medical sales position. So that's the Baxter stuff. Or Baxter's part of it. Baxter is, it was called Baxter Travanol at the time. So if you go to the hospital and you're ever taking an IV fluid, it's either going to be Baxter or Abbott. Wow. So they, they sold water. I wasn't with that division, but it was a highly profitable business. Uh, I interviewed for them, and I also interviewed with a division of Johnson Johnson called Ethicon, which sells sutures and, and silk uh, for the OR. But it was just a boring 
job, I felt. It was basically going and doing inventory because they had like 90% of the market. So the Baxter opportunity presented itself. Did that for about, it was a division they were starting up, did that for about two and a half years. And they brought a guy in from a company, I'll name it, it's called U.S. Surgical. And they have a reputation and it's well-deserved and it's not a positive one. So they brought a guy in, he became my manager because my manager got promoted. And we did not, we did not G and haw, as they say here. So we wanted to move south. So I, because Betsy's family was here in Atlanta. So we moved, ah. we moved down here. Well, so you married a Southern Belle. She's from Pittsburgh. Oh, sorry, but she moved south. All right. So I love that. Uh, actually, you hit on one thing. Why do people leave? We just uh, talked about this in my CEO accountability group. You don't quit your company, you quit your boss. You quit mm -hmm. the boss hole, man. You're right. You're right. And so you That's quit the boss hole. It's good. I like yeah. that. Yeah. I'd never heard that, but that's We're a out. good one. See? Hey, I'm, I got, I'm, I'm taking a million that one. Guy. I'm taking that one. All right. So awesome. For me. There we go. I'm, I'm saying lost so all, I had, all weeks. I had one of those. So he, um, I, we came down here. I interviewed through a recruiter again, um, a division of Coors, an of Coors company. They had a occupational health division that did audiometric and pulmonary function testing because OSHA required it. So people in, in areas where there were high noise levels were required to have an audiometric test annually and then implementing an, a, 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 a um, hearing conservation program. Right. So in, in manufacturing facilities with Which high volume, course. you had to go back. Yeah. And of course had that. That's exactly right. We had to be checked for our ears. Uh, that's funny. That's right. Oh my God. That's like a, a PTSD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had to get my ears checked when I worked in the. About, that's yeah. right. Hmm. So what did you say? What? I, I didn't know. Did we have to use earplugs? What? Who talking? What? Mom? What? Hello? It's ringing. No, I'm kidding. But the OSHA demanded that and Coors yeah, started right. it. So they took it from the brewery and created a vision that did it. And I was Southeast Territory rep for about a year. And then the president of the division said, we want to promote you to a national level. You can, you're going to come out and be a director. And I was promoted. We moved to Golden, Colorado. I was 20 eight or 29, I was sitting in on board meetings with Bill, Joe, Jeff and Pete Coors and the rest of the board. It was an incredible experience for a kid my age, a young, young guy my age. You didn't think that at the time, meaning kid, right? I mean, were you, were you, uh, did you have that moxie? Did you have that swagger? No, uh, no? I really didn't. I was, no. I was in some ways I was a bit of a poser because I came across a lot more confident than I was. Okay. But it was that most experiences for young people. I mean, at 28, 29, being in the room with Coors, I mean, I mean, Alan would have probably been beside himself and been a little, uh, probably a little too much. Okay, maybe that was me. <laughs> Back in my corporate days. No, I yeah, would have the me. total imposter syndrome in that scenario. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I would have. What am I doing here? When are they going to figure out I, I don't belong in here and they're going to escort me out to the front? Door? And yeah. they kind of did that. Pete did. Pete, and he's... Pete, if you're listening, you I thank you for this because he was he's the guy that was on the Coors commercials, like the Coors Light, the Mountain Spring Water, voice. good looking guys up uh, in the Rockies, and there's snow and in the boardroom, he ain't nothing like that. <laughs> he would he wasn't that guy. He is not that guy. He is a son of a gun, and he saw this young 29 year old, and he challenged me. And I didn't have all of the answers. I had some of the answers, but he gave me moxie and confidence after that experience that was invaluable to me. Hmm. Nice. That That's actually pretty iron good. Iron sharpens iron. Yeah, iron, you know, so he learned how to sell. Then he sits in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. He's got this great experience, 28, 29. You're out in Colorado, mm -hmm. but you're back here in Atlanta. So what happened? Well, we moved there and then they, that same board, about a year and a half after us being out there and having a great time skiing every weekend, they had this course ski. Exactly ski right. Club was forty bucks a year. We got eighteen lift tickets, two lessons. I'm up in the mountains every weekend skiing. Oh, wow. This was incredible. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, it was. Awesome. What are you doing back here? Well, we got we got traffic. He we got a shitty football team. His wife. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. No, we do have the no. Uh, real, we, no, they sold the division. They sold us biotech and ceramics, so they could sell beer. And focus on beer, which they subsequently sold the whole beer division. The whole company sold to Miller or to uh, uh, Molson Molson's, a few years yeah. later. So Molson Coors is what it is today. So um, they left us in Colorado, pretty much high and dry. 
And we didn't want to live there long term. It's a great experience, but we want to be back in Atlanta. So we came back and I joined a company called Norrell. Uh, a guy named Guy Milner ran that. Guy was a great entrepreneur, uh, about a billion dollar company, private. I was with the healthcare division of that. Uh, started out in franchise development with them. There and this begins. Is, this is where the franchise begins. And uh, they saw something in me that they wanted me to get some sales or some operations experience, moved me into a branch, ran that for about, I don't know, six months. Then they promoted me to a regional level where I was over probably about 12 offices in the Southeast, including company owned and franchise operations that they owned or had, or had uh, franchises. And then um, it happened again. They sold the division. So five promotions, six years, got whacked twice. And we had a, what a great time to start a company when you have a one-year-old. And I came home to Betsy and I said, I see no security working for corporations. I've got, I was on a plane every week for seven years, practically more than one flight, more than twice a week. I had I got my million miler during that experience with Delta. Me too. And so, but I said, I don't like it. I don't feel like I am working with people. I really, I had a lot. What was the term you used for your boss? Boss Boss hole. I had a lot of those. (laughs) Right. And so I said, let's do something on our own. So I started up a rep group of about five different manufacturers that we represented. And um, I, I'll tell you a story about that. I think back, I talked to someone else about this morning. I used to stay at, like you, when you were doing corporate, you would stay at the Marriott Hyatt, you know, the nice, nice places, right? I do. I, no, no doubt about it. If you're on the corporate ticket and you're out rolling, yeah. uh, I was a Marriott whore. I'll Me say too. I Me mean, too. I was going to get as many Marriott points as I could. And by Me the too. way, it has paid off Us too. because <laughs> they are buying everybody. But by the way, one of the best, ex- actually, looking back on it, um, if you asked me when I was traveling, would I rather stay at a Ritz or a courtyard? I'm the guy who said, I'd rather stay at the courtyard because if I'm traveling, it's just me and it's work. I can get in and out of the courtyard really quickly. Yeah. If I want my family with me, Ritz all day long. And I know that sounds crazy to a lot of people, mm-hmm. but that's how good Marriott's were. They were phenomenal. And I stayed at all the Marriott's. So not all, I shouldn't, I stayed at a lot of Marriott's. This was before even courtyard was around, I think, around the same time they had started. No, they had started about 10 years earlier. So I sold calculators to them. That was one of my national accounts. When I, the when I at the beginning, I was selling calculators. <laughs> and the first the first Marriott's that opened up were here in Atlanta. One was down by the airport, and one was up there by Northside Hospital. Huh. So anyway, that's a whole other side. Yeah. I'm on a I'm on a rabbit trail. So um I was out we used to pack, she used to Bessie used to pack me meals because we would she'd pack me breakfast and lunch in a cooler. And then I would no, I would breakfast and dinner and I would go out for lunch. I'd get something like at lunchtime. So I'm, I'm calling her. Well, this is before cell phones. So I'm, I would call in and check in with her. And she said, where are you? I said, I'm in Camden, South Carolina. And uh, oh, how's it going? It's going good. I was like probably a month and a half into it. And uh, I said, she said, uh, where are you staying? I'm at the Holly Inn. The the Holiday Inn? No, I'm at the Holly Inn. <laughs> oh. In Camden, South Carolina. It was like $39 a night. Right. Not 139 like you and I were accustomed Right, because you're on your own ticket now. On my own ticket. Hello. So yes. back to the uh, Ritz versus Courier. That's why I used to tell people that going, hey, look at me. I'm saving. Oh, company. you're such a great guy. Right. And then I start my own business. <laughs> and what am I doing? Murder. I'd be like, oh, yeah. yeah. So I, uh, I, uh, I. <laughs> I tra- I, tra- I traveled to see a buddy. I'm like, hey, can I shack up with you this night? I'm coming to see this guy uh, to understand a little bit more about how to run a handyman business. So I slept with him because I would spend the money on my own. Absolutely. Right? I mean, because, you know, I ran a $20 million uh, operational budget. And when I started my business, you know, you're like 20 million. And so you're like, you lose five there, you lose 10 there. And I'm talking about tens of thousands. No big deal. When it's your own money, dude, every freaking dollar every dollar made a difference and that's the difference between us and the coca-cola ceo every dollar makes sense but you know what every dollar should make sense yeah. that's the problem i mean that's what we're missing <laughs> yeah you got to pinch pennies to make millions and you can pinch pennies and you can make millions watch me go mm-hmm. yep so but i we had no other choice because i was 35 30 i don't know what so i was mid 30s we didn't have a lot of money uh, we had a house, but we were mortgaged. And so th- 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 you've heard this failure was not an option. It was, I was either all in and I, w- and I was not going to go back to corporate. I was determined 
you know, the, the pain chart on the side of the doctor's office where you got the smiley face on the left and the happy on the right. And you got the guy who's got tears rolled out his cheek. I'm beyond that. I was just, and I said, I, this is like, I've been liberated. I am not going back to a corporate role. So I was not going to allow it. Plus your father has a great influence on you. And he's, he talked to my uncle and he said, he's going to go out on his own and he's going to be he'll be done in this business within two years. Oh, and don't ever tell me that because I'm going to prove you wrong. Prove you wrong. Oh and, man. And so I, and so thanks pops. Yeah. Well, he yeah. was a motivator. He taught me, he gave me a work ethic as well that I still have today. So I decided, you know, wrapping is good, but you don't build up any, any equity in a business because you are the business. Like in your business, you're building up a nice little business. You can sell one day if you decide to do so. If you're a rep, Amen. you're a hired gun. You don't really build up any equity. And so I... Um, sorry, Chris. Think- I know that hurt. Uh, I, I, you want me to call is that too, Is that too close? I'm sorry. I oh, just, no. We'll oh, just no. make him another uh, appointment with his therapist. Yeah, that's, that's okay. A, Go ahead. Right, don't worry. Okay. I'll, I'll figure that out yeah. later. So I decided... I found this one product that I liked. It was a German manufactured um, uh, device used for inhalation therapy, and it was really cool. And it, it was unique. It was like a, it wasn't the cheapest. It was double the cost of the other. So that you can you can relate to that from my days of calculators. But I love the product. But they didn't need reps. But they need someone who would do distribution. And so I thought I thought well let's dabble in distribution. What the heck? Let's give it a try. So. I do. You know, one thing about we've established here, you actually are a risk taker. You, you, you on the risk scale again. Back to the because uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna use that uh, happy, sad, pain scale. Yeah. But, but from risk to safety, you're you're more of a risk taker. I than am you're a safety guy. Yeah, I am. Yeah. yeah. Well, and he's got this grand, wide wealth of experience. Yeah. I mean, I mean that's that's why. That's why this is yeah. one time going through the experience as you listening, you're learning a ton yeah. about this guy and what's going on. Well, and but- I remember when I bought a franchise, you know, and I met with a consultant and then later on I met with Steve and he, I mean, such a difference when you have somebody with this kind of a background, because everything that came out of Steve's mouth, I'm like, Oh, I wish that. I, I wish you had known. Yeah, right. I wish I had known you too. Cause <laughs> yeah. I remember all, your all <laughs> furniture stores. I recall. It, let's not talk about it. Yeah. I I'm remember gonna, that. We're going to get a double it, therapy well, session. It was, with, uh, it was not uh, great. No. No. I know it didn't turn out well. Wait, wait, hang on. Everybody hang on. Hang on. We're going to pause for a minute. All right. We're back. I got Alan <laughs> back off the floor. Steve, thank you so much for bringing up that traumatic experience. But we're not going to talk about that anymore. That uh, been what we were crying about. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we were crying about yeah. some story about you in the Philippines, but whatever. No, oh, yeah. we're not going back there, everybody. Was. Hey, I just got Alan back. We did smelling salts. It back was back in the... Indonesia. But anyway, yeah, yeah we'll talk two, about that. 2008. So, okay. All right. So, but I actually, it seems like everything you did leading up to this did make you the quintessential franchise consultant because you are risk taking. And then that's, I think that's hard because, you know, when people talk to franchise consultants, one of those things you got to ask is, have you been there, done that? Uh, Have you taken a risk before? Do you know what risk looks like? Do you know what it means to have a one-year-old and not be able to figure out if you're going to put food on the table next month? Do you know what it's like to have to pay people and not make any money while you're doing it? Because that's the stuff that people just don't get when they're thinking about certain mm-hmm. business. Well, and I think a lot of franchise consultants, they're just trying to match your personality with a brand. But I think Steve just has this background. He can look you in the eye and know, you you know, are you a risk taker? And you go, sure, I'm a big risk taker. But because of the experiences he's had, he can ask you a couple of questions and find out, well, you think you are, but you've never done it before. Let me let me you know nudge it in this direction. There are there are a lot of people who are posers. They really think that they are, and quite frankly, a franchise is actually a good thing if you're if you are risk somewhat. You have to have to take be willing to take a risk, but if you're on the risk averse side, it's the it's a better option for a lot of people to go because it's proven, it's documented. They train, they provide support. There's a network of owners, so there's something there. But what I've learned about myself. Uh, over the years, Chris, is that I am, a lot of people want to be third, fourth, or fifth, but there aren't many people that want to be first or second. I love being first or second. So explain that a little bit more. So this, the device that they were, they were bringing in from Germany, they had limited distribution. It was, I had to bring in inventory. I had to carry the inventory. My wife was the shipping and receiving department was at our garage 
<laughs> so I, I volunteered her. No, I didn't. I, I, I asked her if she would help me with that. And she was, <laughs> she did. And so we had two babies at that time. So she was the UPS guy would show up and she, the, the second one came out with blonde hair and I was on the road a lot. And people were like, where did he come from? <laughs> <laughs> I said, that matched the profile. So those, those in podcast land, uh, no, Steve doesn't have any blonde hair. <laughs> and you know what? Uh, there's no way Betsy cheated on him. She is the shipping and receiving department at headquarters. And the UPS driver was there every day and he was a blonde. So mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I, but we had, we had DNA checks and everything's safe. So we're, it's all good. Oh, it's definitely my <laughs> Cause, uh, all right. Cause if not, I know somebody. You know what I'm saying? Okay, okay. I got a guy for that. Good to know. Thank yeah. you for that. Welcome to my visit. So what I mean by no one wants to be free, no one wanted to bring in that product and distribute it. I, I'll do it. No one, not many people want to be the first one in line, not in line, the first one in the line to try something. And I love doing that. If I, But it's a calculated risk. I have to be convinced myself. What? That ha that is value that's uh, valuable. On the flip side of that, your customer, a lot of them don't want to be the first either, yeah. right? So you yeah. had to overcome that as well. Yes, but remember the calculator, the four hundred ninety eight yeah. calculator. If there's a value, which this product had it, and the delivery of the medication, which was albuterol, um, if you got kids who are taking albuterol inhalation therapy with a nebulizer, compressor nebulizer, there's a product called PARI. It's still on the market, P-A-R-I. Hands down the best product in the market because it works more effectively with the medication. The delivery system of the medication was far better. So I would go out and detail doctors and uh, pharmacists and home care companies. All right, when you say I go out, yeah, let's talk about how I go out. That's cold calling. That's it, pulling hand. It is. I mean, that's copier yeah. sales right there. That's it. You know, everybody thinks it's sexy, but it's still copier sales pulling handles. That's. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, back to how was that in your DNA? To just go out there and start yanking handles and say, "Hey, I'm here. Uh, let me tell you about." this. <laughs> he had his thing. dad in the back of his head. You know, it. I thrive on that, right? You and you, you got to thrive on that because honestly, uh, Alan and I have talked about this. That's not my. That's not my. That's not the way I built my business. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact. About a month into it, I realized I had a B2C business that I didn't know I was starting. I thought, because uh, I had been B2B all my life. I had yeah. been manufacturing. I had been a consultant. I had been, I had been a machinist. I had never been a B2C. And I'm like, oh, my God, what am I doing? So you're pulling handles. And that's yeah. I mean, cold calls. Well, Guys, just, I would tell you, I mean, it's hard. It, it is. So just for the listeners who have to do it, what's your mindset? You said you thrive on it. I mean, what are you thinking? Because you know the odds are against you, right? Okay. What is the worst that can happen? They say no. Yeah, but you don't give them the chance to say no. <laughs> See, that's the thing that's key about sales is I think we're going to buy some cop uh, some calculators by the time this podcast is done. I I'm, I'm going to get a fourteen by ten calculator, <laughs> vintage for nine hundred and eighty dollars, right. just so I can say I have. I, that. I'll they tell you a story. About Steve. They, they hold their value. Really I know. Well. I, I think I'm in the trance. I'm like, oh, I must gotta buy one. I must gotta buy one. The Russians have it. I'm gonna get it. <laughs> I'll tell you a story about a calculator sales call we did. I had this young rep. He was. I was. I was young. I was 24. <laughs> he was 22. We go to this uh, to the CPA's office, and they had this really, really modern, new programmable calculator. And if you saw it, it would it would be a joke by today. But it was able to do routine calculations. You could program it and do the calculations over and over again. And it sold for about I'm going by memory 550 dollars. And this guy named was Paul Demock. He had a great career with FedEx. And we went on, he called me, he had come out on the sales call with me, I need some help. I said, okay, he was young, new, new rep. And so I went in and I made the presentation and we were sitting, like you two are sitting over there and I'm in the, the CPA is over here. I'm sitting on one side of the table. He's on the other. And uh, I did my presentation and I sat back and I let him process. And then there's, there's you have to be quiet. Because what I asked him then was, not do you want to buy it? It's how many do you how many do you need? And then the first one who talks loses. They always say that, right? So yeah. Paul, he was about I could see him opening his mouth, and I literally kicked him <laughs> to shut him up so he wouldn't talk. And the guy ordered five of them. But that's. There's a technique if if you're in if you have your own business, which many of your listeners do, you you need to go get if you're particularly if you're doing B2B, 
because business to business is really more sales driven. B to C is more marketing driven. There is a sales sales element, but in your business, you don't have to go and do estimates and so forth. Someone's going to use your service or not. But if you're selling, if you have like a painting French, a painting business, flooring, um, you name it, anything on home improvements, you have got to learn how to sell. And there's a there's a skill to it. People have this misperception that selling is you you got to twist someone's arm to do it. It's really easy. If you on the front end find out what the customer needs and wants, what are their pain points, and you have a solution, there's no selling. But you've done a good job on the front end by identifying what that is before you go into your presentation because you target your presentation to that customer's need. Think of it as if you're a um, if you're if you do archery and you've got 10 I used to try I used to, I've written sales training for this. You have 12 arrows in your in your quiver. And one or two is going to hit that bullseye. But you don't know what the bullseye is if you haven't done a good job on the front end of asking the customer what is their need and what are their what are their biggest pains. Right. And then if you've identified that properly and you have a solution, well you just pull those two arrows out and you shoot them and you've got the solution. If you if you're shooting taking the shotgun approach, you are being foolish. So get some sales training. I did I the, the the I did a kind of a mashup of three different trainings. I did one was Dale Carnegie, which is a class. That's a phenomenal one. It's, it's still applicable today. Mm -hmm. And two others. And what I wrote was what were the company, two others? Sandler? Sandler? No, it wasn't Sandler. Um, the gentleman is no longer around. I don't even know the name of it. He, that was a guy named Bill. He was a the gentleman's no longer around. I'm I'm pretty sure Carnegie and Sandler are around. <laughs> no, <but> anyway. <laughs> Bill isn't either. He he was he's long gone. But yeah. there were three that I had that I had done or taken, and I kind of did a mashup of all three of those at Norell. Yeah, nice. I wrote it for that. So that that's well, we got off on track there. But that, no, no, you actually yeah. you well, you hit on something that's huge for everybody. You've got to have a sales process. You had mentioned in my business, I have a handyman and a remodeling business, so we do have a sales okay. process. Yeah, and so. Um, we've, we've had consultants in and I have a well-documented sales process, but when I had a, my last consultant come in and talk with us, he said, there are three kinds of sales. There's Dale Carnegie, there's Sandler, and then there's Chris. And he's looking at me, the owner, and he says, what does Chris do? He wings it because <laughs> Chris, Chris can do it. And I don't yeah. want Chris to change. He said, but if you want to be like Chris and sell like Chris does at over half of what he sees, you need to follow this process. And I was like, because I said, yes, you have to absolutely. Mm -hmm. But you, you just hit on it's, it's sales. And that is in almost everything. I think that's in life. That is one of the things, uh, Al and I, uh, love, uh, teaching young people about how to become entrepreneurs. And, and, uh, we, we desperately try to teach young college people about how to, not just to be entrepreneurs, but how to be successful in life. And we do it over the summers and we're going to, we're going to keep trying. We're going to keep putting that out there and we're going to get people to come. But one of the things we talk about right off the bat is, you know, you got to sell yourself. Mm -hmm. You got to, you got to success skills are foundational. And that is sometimes you just got to show up. Sometimes you got to do the shit. Nobody else does. That's true. And then you got to always be selling yourself. And if you're not doing it in high school and then college, and then even if you're in a position right now where you think, I don't need to be selling myself. Yes, you do. You have to. And so how do you sell yourself? What are their pain points? Mm -hmm. What arrow can I pull out of my quiver and can I shoot and hit his pain point or her pain point and make that sale? And if it's your boss or if it's whatever, it's the it's the arrow that hits. And so I use the arrow in the quiver all the time with my guy. Oh, you do? I do. I use the same thing yep. because in my business, our unique selling proposition uh, for the trusted toolbox is that, you know, we're, we're back on check. We're fully insured. We're a business. Go check us out on Trustdale. Mm -hmm. We're willing to put ourselves out there. We're the highest rated uh, handyman company out there. And we got a full-time schedule. I mean, we have so many arrows that they can pull. Mm -hmm. They got to find out what the pain point That's is. That's exactly right. Right? Yeah. So You're not that, selling on price. You're selling on value. And, yeah. And what you're, what you're I have for. to because handyman's a commodity and yeah. definitely a cheap commodity mm -hmm. in in the traditional sense. Yeah. yeah. All right. So as you... uh as you arced into the franchise consulting. Um, so I know cause we're running out of time, and yeah. I know I, but this has been incredible conversation, right? Yeah. Chris, I love listening to you talk. <laughs> so, Hey, I, Alan's going to get revived here in a minute uh, because I got the power paddles out and he might go down. Don't I'm worry local. I can always come back for another one. If you want to come back for that. <laughs> this is fun. So let, let's go. Let's, let's fast forward then. So I, 
that little distribution company, that little distribution company of our garage, eight years later, I sold it to a publicly traded company. That's we grew it to that point. So that was a great exit. No, it wasn't. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and so no, it wasn't. So here's what happened. You remember back in 2000, where there was a bunch of dot, dot coms coming out that became dot bombs. Oh yeah. yeah, I was such a good investor until they bombed. Yeah, yeah. So I was too. So I sold to a dot bomb, mm. and I I shouldn't say it wasn't bad. It was it was a definite learning experience. So I sold the business for 3.5 million. I took about 3 million of that in stock. Oh. oh. Wah, wah, wah. Hey everybody, drive it. <laughs> everybody, do it with me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and I had to buy. Because to... everybody went three and a half million. They're like, "Hell yeah, sign me up, bro! I got that all day long. Put uh, that, in, uh, that in my bank account." Of course, by the way, everybody, if you think you're going to take a three and a half million and put it in your bank, um, you can make that half. Uh, actually, make it forty percent if you're lucky. But you took the chance when uh, the right way. By the way, we all should do this. You sell, you pour back in because you want to monetize and go, but who knew it was going to blow up? Their currency was their equity. Oh, and I took so it in bad. stock, and I had hold it for a year, so it went from $9 a share to, I took 30, it in stock. to 32 cents. That's one place you took it. So yeah, That's right. Why didn't you sell at 35 cents? I, well, I, I, I <laughs> Hope springs eternal, Alan. <laughs> so I wrote it all the way down. It was an incredible experience because I had uh, – in my faith journey and something amazing happening then. So anyway, that was a whole nother side story in my journey. And then I thought, I thought I was going to retire at 40. I thought I was done and God had a different plan. So I found a franchise that does garment and textile restoration. Now here's another pivot for you. Go back, but back to the dry cleaning days. This guy has been everywhere. Mm -hmm. Back to the dry cleaning days. My dad had a dry cleaning business. This company's in dry cleaning. They do garment and textile rest restoration mostly for house fires, mold, water. And it was a franchise. We were number 22, I think, and they have about 130 now. And I liked the franchise system. Going back to my days at Norell when I was in the franchise space. So think of all these things that we're flashbacking to. And we bought it with a business partner. And uh, bought most of North Georgia and then ran that for seven years. And one of, and did very well with that. Exited in 2010, sold my share to a business, one of my business partners. But here's what I learned from that. $3 million? No. Okay, right. Just I think. wish. Yeah, right. So, yeah, um, everybody. but what, what I learned from that experience is there's two ships I don't want to be on. Partnership? And a sinking ship. And a sinking ship. It's oh, not that the... everybody, big drop. I don't know if you've ever heard that one before. I don't know, but I uh, use ship in a whole different world. But partnership and sinking ship, go. Not to say that they don't work. They didn't for me. And if you do a partnership, you need to call me because I will tell you what to avoid because you need to have that thing buttoned up tight because life happens. And when life happens, you better be ready for it and have it documented by a, a documented operating hey, we're, agreement. We're rolling this one in 24. If you've been with us the whole time, which a lot of people haven't because we have gained a ton of listeners in 23, we have talked about partnerships a lot over the last two and a half mm -hmm. years that we've been doing this. Uh, listen to that wise, wise sage advice and go really look into this. We may go check out a couple of back. our episodes about what partnerships can and can't be. Because it can work. It can yes. work. We've had people on to talk about yeah. great success, but we have so many stories of mm -hmm. how it doesn't work mm -hmm. because you're not willing to talk about what the divorce looks like. Right. Because it's divorce. It's marriage, people. It it's is. marriage. And it can lead to a divorce of your marriage as well because of the stress that that can bring to your marriage. If your wife is your partner, she or he may not be involved in the business, but they should be involved in the decision about the business. Which is why he led with, I've been married for 39 years, because after you tell his story, you're like, this lady's a saint. She's I mean, amazing. He's not Catholic, but, she's but amazing. Dude, I'm about to saint this chick because, dude, he, she stayed with you for 39 years. And, yeah. and uh, again, it's not always rosy, everybody. I was going to say, to say it's, uh, Steve's marriage is probably a happy marriage. Yeah, it sounds like it. It is. It's awesome. There you go. Huh? Pretty cool. All right. You, you definitely married the right chick. We're going to have her on. Oh, that would be cool. <laughs> her side of it. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, maybe I don't want to be here for that, but I will. You know what? We'll put you in another room. Like, uh, like, what was that? What was that? Was that? What was that one making Whoopi show? What was? Come on. Oh. Oh, come on, Chris. Oh, bad reference. But Bob still, Eubanks. Right? Bob Eubanks doing the wedding, the uh, marriage, newlywed. Oh, newlywed newly game. Oh, yeah, yeah. We could have her answer a question. Bring Steve yeah. out. Yeah. Hey, did you like this? 
And Steve went, yeah, she was my shipping and receiving consultant with two kids, and she had a blast. She goes, that was the worst time of my life. <laughs> All, right. All right, man. We're coming close to the end, man. we got about 10 minutes. So okay. we want to jump into – you've helped people with franchises. I do. I, and I you do. help people think about career transitions. Uh -huh. That's what this is about, right? I mean, a lot of people are taking career transitions. If you could summarize it, what's the top three – best things what are the top three worst things what would you give advice to somebody okay so let me explain who my client is my client is an acronym i use fred f-r-e-d and it can be any one or all four of these someone who's frustrated in their career but they don't quite know how to escape it or what their options are r is someone who is readying for retirement or has retired and decided this ain't for me i want to do something else that's r e entrepreneurial but they may not have had an opportunity to express that because they've been in a corporate role or otherwise, then D is downsized. That's Fred. Now, entrepreneurial, I'm entrepreneurial, but I'm a better operator, I think, than I am an entrepreneur, probably some of both, but it could be F-R-O-D, like owner-operator, instead of E, but fraud doesn't come off the tongue as well. Fred does. I, I use Fred. I'd, I'd say stick with Fred over fraud yeah, because so honestly, too. a lot of us in business are frauds. Yeah. I mean, we're trying hard, bros. Come on. Get, uh... it, it, it could be the title of the podcast. Are you Fred? Or are you fraud? Yeah. I like that one. All right. Hey, let's keep going. So I, Fred. I, I come alongside that, that individual and through conversation determine if self-employment is appropriate for them or not. And that's a big if because some people have no, excuse me, have no business being in business. And you'll tell them that, right? Yes. See, and there's the difference with the Steve Miller plan. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. So a uh, little cough dump. We're Thank back. You. So one of the things we, we led with, and if you're still sticking with us, which you have to, because this has been fascinating, is that as he helps people with the franchises, he's the one who's going to shoot. I've heard so many great things about he will tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And a lot of people, it's the people he just talked about, I'm frustrated. I'm ready to leave. I'm an entrepreneur. I've been downsized. Every one of us thinks we're the smartest guy in the room in that situation, though. We may have been hit. Yeah. We may have had a little shot to the ego, but all of us think that we were successful and can do it anywhere. Because if I did it here, I can do it anywhere because it's New York. Actually, we're in Atlanta, but let's keep going. Well, the, a lot of... <laughs> Come on, that's a great graphic. That was pretty funny. I got to give you that one. <laughs> well, you mentioned Scott Specker earlier. His client. Right. He was with AC Nielsen at Coca-Cola. Right. And he fancied himself as being entrepreneurial. So he and Sharon, I met with them. And Scott, you know Scott. He's very self-confident. And so extremely we Scott. Yeah. I'm gonna make him listen to this because he he's gonna love hearing yeah. that one. So Sharon and I and too much Sharon and he and I sat down and talked. And um he's awesome. He wanted to open up a uh, retail soccer and lacrosse business yep oh i can only imagine what came out of your mouth when you said that yeah and said i said that. i think that's a really in a nice way in the most diplomatic way as possible i said you are a fool for even thinking about this <laughs> so i said just think of this business and who your competition is and because he fancied himself in it because he fell in love with the product and not the business so he didn't look at it really practically so um i Introduced him to about five options because he was he was suited well suited to, to be self employed. So I introduced him to five options, and one of them was a painting franchise, which he owns today. And he said, "I'm not gonna paint. I can't paint. I'm not interested." And Sharon said, "Listen to him. He, I can see you doing that and being successful." He says, "Who's?" She said, "Whose side are you on?" And she said, I'm on your side, but he's right. Listen to him. All you're doing is having a conversation. Dude, he is so mimicking you, Scott. Yeah. Because I'm making Scott. I actually just texted Scott and tell him, uh, this episode, when it comes out, you're going to listen. <laughs> so, he's a good buddy of mine. Yeah. So he began to have a conversation with the franchise rep. And then uh, first call, I have a follow-up call every week with most clients, and or every client rather, and said, uh, so how's it going? He said, well, that painting thing, I'm having another conversation with the painting guy. and." Then the next one, that, that's kind of interesting. And then he warmed up to it over time. I don't know if he ever admitted that I was right, but he. But... <laughs> I don't know. No, actually, yes. No, to his credit, yeah, I mean, he's an incredible operator. He, he really is. Does. And, he's and I love, I've met him. And uh, I love, have 
met him doing the entrepreneurial thing that we do and we're still very tight today so it's and awesome. he and i we're going to see him we got a, a place in puerto rico we're going to they're going to be down there and we're going to see them down there because we love to spend time with he and sharon so yeah. I, some of these clients become friends they don't they're not my enemies they're my friends because i set them up to hopefully succeed anyway yeah he got rookie of the year franchise of the year he's got a multi-million dollar business today he is killing it yeah but i have been blessed with a gift of discernment it's a gift of mine it's a spiritual mm-hmm. gift of mine so I can see situation like you, I can see things that some people, a lot of people can't see like that. But it's got to be from your background, right? I mean, look at Partly. all the, I mean, your experiences, right? You've been from Ohio to DC, to Atlanta, to Colorado and back. And so while that's not the entire world, the world you were in and the business side has been amazing. I yeah. mean, in, in fact, how many different industries you were in and doing things gives you a breadth of knowledge. So it does. I know everybody listening to this, you're thinking, boy, I really need this sage advice. And you do. But you know what? He's in really short demand because he's thinking about saying, I'm done. Because we asked him right before we got started. Hey, how can we push you out? And, you know, let's uh, tell everybody. He goes, well, I'm pretty I'm pretty tight on who I want, you know, so um so, you know, if you want to, you reach out to me first and um and then I'll kick it back to him. But Steve, how do people get in touch with you? Well, they can you can go to my website, which is myfranchisenavigator.com. I think I think that's it, that, that is it. But I work almost exclusively on referral now. So, if you if your listeners want to engage, go to the website or they can email me at steve miller coach at gmail.com and my number is 404-787-5897 if you contact me by phone text me because i don't answer 90 percent of the calls that come in 10 so just text me all right you heard it all everybody mm-hmm. listen uh this guy doesn't come around much and uh you're going to get somebody that you absolutely 100 percent want to get in touch with if you're thinking about starting a business and you want to get a franchise background and you want to figure out are you the right person to do this or are you the right person to do that you got to find this guy, but you got to use a small business safari as a reference because he may not talk to you. And actually, he is like at the end of this he's show, like Yoda. And you, like you got to go find him on that. At planet. the end of the show, I'm going to say you want to use Alan Wyatt, which Alan has been uh, my co-host and loves listening to me talk all the time. But uh, if you want to buy a property in Atlanta, you got to go with Alan, right? So I'm pushing everybody except me. All right, so. We got to get this thing wrapped up because you guys are driving around. You're probably in between appointments, doing this thing, doing this thing, doing that thing. You got to make it happen, man. It's January 2024. We got to make this shit happen. Let's make it go. All right. But now we got to ask those final four questions. Steve Yoda, what is a book you would you would you reference to her? I get this. What is a book you would uh, refer to our customers? Yeah, not customers. <laughs> Your <that>. Listeners. <laughs> oh, yeah, listeners. Sorry. There's I'm a okay. lot of sage advice in one of the oldest books I know of, which is the Bible. There's a tremendous amount in Proverbs and otherwise, so I would spend time in there. Good book, original book. Let's make it happen. I tell you what, there is a lot of business application in Proverbs, oh, yeah. isn't there? It's yes. amazing. And Paul was a tent maker. That's he, right. he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. So he's got a lot of, there's a lot of business stuff in there. And then there's a, a, a organization that I would like people to pick up the book for called uh, During School Hours. During School Hours by Joel Penn. Pick that, let's take, check that one out as well. It's an, an organization. I'm semi-working, as I've said. I'm semi-working and I'm semi-volunteering. I'm volunteering with that organization. It's called LifeWise Academy. It's a phenomenal book. So those two. Nice. Those are awesome. That's the reason I was stumbling over myself because actually I, I saw the preview and he said the Bible and I was I was uh, stumbling on that one because that's a big reference, everybody, you know, and it, we're not trying to be a religious show, but, you know, every once in a while you got to think about it. If you're not there, you're not there. You got to make it happen. So let's go to number two. You ready? Yeah. B. A, a, a question B. What's the favorite feature of your home? Oh, you're throwing me off here. Um I wasn't ready for this one. The favorite feature of my home is probably our new kitchen. Oh. I don't cook. Betsy is an incredible cook, so it's a match made in heaven. She loves to cook. I love to eat. And the stuff she prepares in that kitchen for us to eat is amazing. So I would say the kitchen. So what was it about the kitchen that made Betsy happy? Oh, Lord. Uh, The lighting, the new appliances, the, the refrigerator, 
But just it, we also opened it up into the living space because she she loves to be social. She loves to. Uh, she's got a gift for hospitality and she can be while she's in the kitchen preparing. She can talk. It was, it wasn't that way before, but it opened things up. All right. So I'm just going to call it out right now. You, you got a restaurant management degree. And yeah. The first thing we said in your kitchen was lighting. Um, so uh, eh, he's wrong. It's food, man. It's food. I'm going to tell you, bro. Come on. <laughs> Bessie loves to cook. It's food, bro. Come on. Yeah. All right. We're going to keep moving on. <laughs> you're gonna, uh, no, you're gonna, you're gonna, I, I'm not ready. I, you told me one question. You didn't give me no, there's, there's four. So there's, right. there's four. We got to keep going. All you ready? Right. Oh, yeah. we're through another curveball. When you're out and you're the customer, what is a customer service pet peeve of yours? And the reason we're interested in this is because we are customer service freaks. Hello. All right. I had an experience with this just yesterday. Someone I had met through a networking organization made a presentation about um, an insurance program, insurance policy. And when, you, when you're my age, you become worried, a little more concerned about, you know, nursing home or assisted living or whatever. So there was supposedly a product that she offered that was available to me to talk about that. She had no clue about what she was talking about. She listened to me for about two minutes and then dove into these options. And I'll quote this for you right now. It's like, and I, and I said, Okay, you go talk to the person who trained you because I don't have time for this right now. And then come back with me with to me with a solution and a proposal because my time is valuable. And I didn't say this, but really had no clue what she was talking about. So that's if you're coming across as an expert, as, as particularly something as important as in remodeling, real estate, those are big deals. Mm -hmm. And insurance is a big deal because if I have a situation where I need it, I'm going to rely upon the person that sold me the right policy and as an advisor, just like I am with my clients, you need to know your stuff. So I think that's probably my second one. You're right. People, people selling, got to know your stuff. You, you've got to, and uh, he keeps saying stuff. So I'm going to say stuff, but anyway, uh, I'm trying to keep it PC because I know he, he did just say he, the Bible. He, he referenced the Bible, but I've referenced the Bible before, <laughs> Alan. I and I've referenced the Bible with a whole different thing. Yeah. By the way, my words were not, explicitly wrong in the bible but it will keep going all right oh my goodness steve i got a story to tell you offline but <laughs> okay we're we're talk. all right we'll we'll talk. we want a diy nightmare story not a contractor nightmare something you screwed oh, up oh good own. lord okay. and we love fire dismemberment all right perhaps <laughs> i've got it i've got a somewhat i've got a <laughs> which, <laughs> which by the way i've done all <laughs> so what i have learned about myself is when it comes to fixing things, the best tool in my toolbox is my checkbook. <laughs> so I was putting in a light above the sink in our bathroom, and I was on a ladder. You know, one of those little ladders that you have, it's a probably two steps. It's a little metal thing, and it's got this little clip hanging out of it. You, you open and close it with that clip. So I'm up there <laughs> putting this light fixture in, and I had I was torquing it because it's hard to get in. And that daggone thing flipped out, that ladder flipped out from under me, that little stool. And that little clip caught my leg and it just opened my leg up. It, it must have been a it was probably a four inch gash. Ooh. And I I just I said I was upstairs and when I called Betsy, she knows she came running up. She said, what's wrong? I said, look at my, I cut myself. You cut, no, you filleted yourself. It was more <laughs> like it. And I would not go to the hospital. I said, I'm not a leg model. I'm not going to be short. Come on. Leg. Come but on. I, tough guy. I, I, and what am I going to say when I get there? You fell off of a one foot. Come on, ladder. tough guy. So I said, I am not going to the hospital. <laughs> so I taped myself up. My leg has a nice scar to remind me. When I want to try to do something on myself by myself, I'm calling the trusted toolbox. I'm not yeah. going to do it myself. You know, you should. However, uh, I'm going to give you mafioso credit is that you wouldn't go to the hospital. I'm not going for this little thing. You know, it's just a flesh wound. Hey, you got shot. It's okay. We're not bringing. So I love that. I love that about you. He might be Italian. I don't know. Steve Miller <laughs> from Ohio. Hungary. I mean, my last name is Millerina. Me. Yeah, it might be. All right. Everybody, if you didn't learn something, that's on you because Miller just took us through the world. And this is Fly Like an Eagle, Steve Miller, franchise consultant. He actually doesn't even want to talk to you. No, I'm kidding. He does want to talk to you. He wants to hear about you and your stories, but you got to talk to him about how you found him because he, he only talks to a certain subset of people. And we are those people.
You we're, are my we're, people. We're, we're a subset. We're that people. <laughs> All right, everybody. Hey, thanks for hanging with us today. It was a good time. We're going to see you next week. When next time on the Small Business of Fire, we're going to rock it out. We're going to make it happen. We're going to get you up that mountaintop of success. We're out of here. Let's make it happen. Steve, you're the best.